since we met last things we've been um, doing the stream keepers had training we had um, I think eight or nine um, people uh, who participated and some new folks who were involved and this is the um, adopt a stream training we had a great time it is fascinating and interesting and if ever if you weren't able to participate in that training but you'd like to come along on we call them a splash along and you can just go out with us when we do a stream monitoring event just let myself or Brian Vassar know that you want Alicia Klink is now part of the team let us know that you want to go out and see what it's all about and it's um, no commitment it's just fun to get out there in the streams I think you'll be amazed um, you might have seen on social media, Danny Day posted some recent bacterial results. He's been doing testing at the beach swimming area. That's part of the Stream Keepers program. So um, all of the, you know, just to sort of tie that together, the fundraising that we do supports the purchase of the chemicals that go into the materials that go into that sort of testing. Um, I think, you know, it's an elephant, stilt grass, um, and we're taking a bite right one bite at a time that's how you eat it I'll leave it at that um, the Tamarack Treasures donations continue that's what's going on in the hallway we've we're, we have incredible response from the community October 15th is the sale It's just one day this holiday edition so make sure that you are able to participate because there's a, a wonderful stuff available there and we had our trail work day and it rained but we did get some things done we got some um, rocks reset. Um, we got some logs cut off a trail. And it, and it gave me an idea that I just want to kind of, you know, I'm going to throw it out there and then maybe you can give me your input. Um, there are a lot of people who want to help with things, but the days, you know, it rains or I had something else. I was out of town that weekend. I, you know, for whatever reason, the, the idea, it seems like we're all just incredibly busy. So of coordinating schedules and at a certain time, it's, it's difficult. So I thought about having a, a list of things. Maybe we call it MOVE. Maybe it's something else. Many opportunities for volunteer engagement. Thought it was kind of catchy. And if we, ca if we create a list of sort of discrete tasks, these are things that, and, and present it like an angel tree. I'm thinking and and you can if you want to help um, you can take a task and you can do it at your own time and it's convenient for you it's sort of discreet defined no long-term commitment one thing you can do it with your family with your neighbor when it's convenient so um, and and then you can feel good about in, in, in you know supporting the community with those types of things it could be like writing an echo article it could be coming for one meeting and helping to set up and tear down the room for for a meeting it can be clearing a, a down tree off the trail it could be you know clearing a, a picking up branches in a certain area of a trail if that sort of thing sounds um, interesting then show of hands who might think that they who don't participate maybe in some of our work days but they might do that might take an angel yeah okay yes and you know so I think um, we some people have said and we can do levels and you can become a VIP or and I'm like okay I'll see how complicated it gets but it's just a way to try to have people um, no ways that they can participate in in c the community so appreciate your feedback on that okay so what's blooming um, what's blooming out there now you know, we're kind of at the end of the blooming season but the asters um, the native asters are the grand finale of the blooming season they bloom late summer and fall so they are just getting started what you have here is a frost aster you know asters are oh here's another one the Maryland Golden Aster, they're, the, they're very well known, you know, we're very familiar with them, these daisy-like flowers, they come in many sizes and shapes and forms. They are um, the last feeding opportunity of the blooming season for pollinators, so they're very important here as we end the year that um, we uh, support the aster population. They are the second largest family of flowers. They have many variations. They can be little, they can be tall. Um, the flowers come in different sizes and forms. Um, sunflowers, all daisies, mums are all in the aster family. Um, many of them grow naturally here and, and I think that a lot, 
a lot of people think about them as weeds because um, one of the reasons is because they don't bloom till late. So you see it growing and it doesn't have a flower on it and it's got a lot of green leaves and some of them like um, the wing stem or crown beard is another name for them. They get very tall and it doesn't seem like it's going to do anything. Um, and so it just must be a useless weed, right? But that's their waiting. Their, their time, their contribution is late summer and fall. So just now we're starting to see goldenrod. Um, bone set is that white stuff that's got the flat crown head, little tinies. We have some on our street just because no one lives past me and it does, the sides of the roads don't get mowed. And so there's one that's like this big and it's um, nine pollinators I counted on it the other day. Three different kinds of wasps, three different kinds of bees, two moths and a butterfly on one plant that really doesn't have very showy flowers, you know, so you might not think that it would um, matter, but anyway. I love the asters. Um, okay, and of course, the pull-up challenge. Just a second, y'all bear with me. I, I sort of reset my expectations for this. Has anybody actually done the pull-up challenge with the calendar, 100 days, checked it off? Yeah, that's what. Kenny, Kenny, yes, I love you, honey. Um, <laughs> he didn't have a choice. Um, but I want to say, like, so I've reset my goals and that, that, that it be awareness, awareness of what the stiltgrass is. So I would ask you this. Because of the pull-up challenge, because of my incessant discussion over stillgrass, um, I'm hoping you're more aware of it. So I'll ask you these questions. Have you noticed it more around the community? Have you talked about it? with your, even if it's just to shake your head and say, God, it's everywhere. Um, do you better understand how it threatens the woodlands, how it threatens the food source for our wildlife that live in the woods? And have you removed any of it? I mean, just to, even if you just picked it up to say like, here, there. So I would like to. Thank you. <laughs> for that. I would, and, and I would like to offer you the opportunity to take one of the prizes that were bought we already have them. You might as well take them. If any, if so, I would call any of this participation in the pull-up challenge. That's so before you leave, come claim your bandana, right? Blue or green, two beautiful colors. And when you see it, when you use it, tie it around your dog's neck. Think about the stillgrass and how you're going to take another bite next year, right? What you've all been waiting for, um, the uh, Georgia Audubon Society. I'm gonna just in, let her introduce herself and tell you about her, Kiana Leverett. Did I say that right? Who's yes. the community outreach director from Georgia Audubon? Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here today. Once again, my name is Kiana Leverett. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. My name is Kiana Leverett. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Georgia Audubon, and I guess I should share a little bit about myself. So I'm originally from Illinois, and I grew up in a place where there was a lot of concrete, but there wasn't a lot of plants or trees. But for some reason, my heart has always been outside. To the dismay of my parents. I was that kid that would pick up snakes outside, I would bring stuff inside and they would be like, what are you doing? I'd put spiders in jars. I thought every animal was cute, I still do. And I just always wanted to help the environment and help animals. So I went to college to be a vet. And I realized that I would make more of an impact if I could talk to as many people as possible and share my love for outside and educate a little bit for those that don't necessarily know in the hopes that if you know something, you'll share it with somebody else and then you spread the awareness around and then everyone's making a difference and the animals that I love and that you love so much are protected because we care about the spaces that they're in. So I went to school at Tuskegee University in Alabama graduated with a degree in environmental science and natural resource management and a minor in wildlife biology. And I've been very blessed to have a career that has spanned federal and state agencies and now I'm working in the nonprofit space as an environmental educator. So if you have any questions, please, please feel free to stop me at any point throughout my presentation. So today I'm here to talk to you guys all about migration. 
But before I start, I want to kind of feel out the room to see just how much we know about birds. So I'm going to play a little game of true or false. If you think the statement that I say is true, please raise your hand. If you think it's not true, don't raise your hand. So true or false, all birds have feathers. If you think it's true, raise your hand. If you don't think it's true, keep your hand down. OK couple of hands. Let's try another question. True or false, there are less than 250 species of birds here in Georgia. There are two, less than 250 species of birds. Do we think that's true? Do we think it's false? True or false? True. <laughs> Every bird migrates. Every bird migrates. Is that true? Is that false? And lastly, true or false, birds need us to survive. True or false? So during my presentation, I hope to answer all of these questions for you. And we'll figure out what is true or false. So as I'm getting into my presentation, I guess I should share a little bit about the organization that I work for. So I represent Georgia Audubon. We are now a statewide nonprofit that specializes in building places where birds and people thrive. And we do this through conservation, education, and community outreach and community engagement. So we do things all around the state now and i'm so happy to be able to come all the way up here to ben tree your community is beautiful and i also brought with me some more information about my organization so if you're ever interested in learning a little bit about what we're doing i brought pamphlets about our organization i brought some pamphlets that'll help you pick specific native plants if you want to attract certain birds to your yard i also brought some business cards if you're interested in reaching out to specific people in our organization. And I also brought information about an, an initiative called Project Safe Light, which is directly during migration to protect birds, and our wildlife sanctuary program. So if you're interested in any of those things, please check out the information that I brought. Okay, now that that is out of the way, on to the presentation. So, Birds come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors. They have different beaks. They live in different places. Some live on the ground. Some live in trees. Some only eat plants. Some only eat other birds. There's so, ma there's so much diversity within the bird community. But the largest group of birds that we see on the regular basis are songbirds. Second to that, depending on where you live, might be raptors or birds of prey. And then after that, if you live near water, you might see a lot of waterfowl and shorebirds. So migration is nothing new. And there were a lot of theories in history about where birds went in the wintertime and what happened to them. So the first theory was that birds went into the lakes and they slept under the mud during the winter time. That was a theory that was had. People thought, oh, where are the birds? Oh, they're in the water. They're underneath the mud. That's where they are. The next thought was that birds transformed into different organisms entirely. So here we have an example. They thought that the barnacle goose became the goose barnacle. They thought they were the same thing. Wondering where the birds went. Oh, they became crustaceans. They became barnacles. That's where they are. And then the last theory that I'd like to mention is that they thought that some birds just became different birds entirely. So here we have pictured an eastern towhee on the right, on the left. And they thought that it transformed into a robin. Two different sizes two different birds, they make two very different calls. And so they thought, oh, I'm not seeing towhees during the winter time, but I see a lot of robins. Maybe those are the towhees. Maybe they just molted and they look different with their feathers. So there were so many different theories about where birds were going, but eventually, through research and observation, they realized that birds would travel to different places and come back, hence 
migration. So migration, what is it? It is a large scale annual movement of a population from one place to another. Georgia is a place where there are more than 500 species of birds and more than 250 of those birds can be found right here in the northern area of Georgia. So this is a major flyway for migration. There are flyways all throughout the country, but there are many birds that fly through this flyway that we live in right now. And for those that don't necessarily notice migration, migration happens twice a year. It happens in the fall, starting in mid-September and sort of rounding out at the beginning of November. And then it happens in the spring when those birds return and you usually see them at the end of February through the beginning of April. So during those times of the year, if you ever hear a lot of birds singing, a lot of bird activity, and you're wondering, what is going on outside? You have a lot of guests in your yard. They're, they're seeing your yard like it's a hotel and they're stopping through to either eat or to get what they need before they pass on to their final destination. So there are a couple ways modernly that scientists learn about migration. The first way is banding and bird banding is essentially when scientists will capture safely birds and they'll place little bands around the ankle of the bird that usually has information like who caught the bird, where it was found, what year, so that way when they continue to band in that same spot, if they catch the same bird, they know, oh, this species of bird or this particular bird is coming back to the same area over and over again. So they're learning about that behavior. Another way that they learn about birds, especially with larger species like birds of prey, is they'll do satellite tracking. And they'll put larger things to monitor birds to see where they're flying to and their flight patterns. And the last way that they learn is through radar images because sometimes during migration, think about Canada geese. When they fly over through the air in these large flocks or mallards, they do the same or crows all sitting on a wire and then flying in a large mass of crows, they fly in groups and those large heat signatures can be seen on a radar. So all they have to do is track that heat and see someone on the ground knowing where or what that species is to be able to figure out, oh, these birds are moving and all they have to do is track the heat signature. So those are some of the more common ways that people figure out which birds are migrating and how they're migrating. So one bird that they love to do this with is this bird and it is an arctic tern and this bird will fly all the way from the northern hemisphere down into St. Croix. So this bird is one of many birds that migrate long distances. A more popular bird that I would think of that you may be familiar with would be a hummingbird. A hummingbird weighs no more than a penny, if you've ever held a penny in your hand. And this bird will only eat nectar and fruit flies and small gnats because it is very small. It has that long long beak so it goes into tubular plants like cardinal flower and different kinds of vines and it'll use all that energy and fly over the Gulf of Mexico in one trip with no stops. Now I don't know about you but I don't think I could fly over or swim over or walk over or run over the Gulf of Mexico on nothing but fruit flies and sugar water. <laughs> it's amazing, but they do it every year. In fact, most of the hummingbirds are probably on their way out right now. If you've ever seen them and you're wondering, oh, where'd they go? They're migrating. So there are lots of migration champions. Here's another, a better picture of our Arctic Tern. They travel more than 25,000 miles a year to and from in the fall and in the spring. You have your hummingbird that will fly over the Gulf of Mexico down into Central America. Here's an example of a bird's heat signature. 
and how they track it. So this bird that I'm mentioning here is called a wood thrush. If you've ever seen it, it kind of reminds me of a robin with the color of its brown coat. You'll find it sitting on the ground. It has a white breast that has black speckles near the top. Question about the hummingbird. Absolutely. I have heard that they, when they fly over the golf, that they will actually ride on a bigger bird. Is that true, that they will land and ride on a bigger bird? I would say that depends on the bird. They're, most of them will do it completely unaided, which blows my mind. But if there was something that occurred like a storm, because you're flying through the ocean during a time of year when there are monsoons, when there are monsoons and it's raining a lot, so it wouldn't surprise me if that bird latched onto another larger bird that was traveling, like an egret or a goose or a swan, or even, well not, not a bird of prey, but <laughs> more than likely a shorebird. So, why do birds migrate? Why? Why do they move? Why do they need to? There's one reason. They need food. There are some areas of the world where it's evergreen all the time. There are berries on the vines all the time. There are insects in the trees that are available as food sources all the time. The water is always clear and available and not frozen. But there are also some areas of the world where it snows, where you have plants that lose their leaves during the fall, and so food sources become very minimal. And there are some birds that depending on their diet, they need to migrate in order to survive. There are birds that stay year round, but the majority of birds migrate. In the winter, food sources are scarce, especially in North America. I'm sure you've noticed that during the winter time, you don't, you don't lose all of your birds, but you may have two or three birds that just sing all the time and that you just see constantly, like a cardinal or a blue jay, or a tufted titmouse, or a crow, just a few examples of birds that don't migrate. So food may not be available here, but it's abundant in places like Costa Rica, like Mexico, like Chile, and other parts of Central America. That is where birds tend to travel, no matter where they're coming from in the world. That is the most densely populated place if you are a birder like myself, to go if you want to see an abundance of birds that are not where they belong at all. So why do they leave the tropics? If I got to go on vacation in Costa Rica all the time, and I could just stay there where there's food for me, there's a food buffet in front of me all the time, I wouldn't want to come home. Well, they come home so that they can raise their young. That is why birds migrate back in the spring. That is also the time when you're likely to see baby birds the most. You're likely to get a more abundance of nests in your yard or in your trees. You'll see a more abundance of birds singing and speaking out because they're trying to attract mates. They're trying to get attention so that they can connect and make a brood. But that kind of space isn't available near the buffet in Costa Rica. It's not available in Mexico where there are millions of birds gathered in one spot because space is scarce. Birds are kind of like us. They need food, they need shelter, they need water, and they need space. So when they travel down to South America and Central America, they have those things, but it's not in abundance. It's just the place in the world where there's the most of it. But when you have a family to raise, you need more space. You can't share a tree with six other bird families. You need your own tree. You need your own space. You need your own water sources. And when there are too many animals sharing the same resource, that resource gets depleted. So spacing out is what's best for the bird survival. So that is why they return in the spring There also are no snakes in the north, the colder it gets, speaking from experience. 
and in the winter and in the winter time there aren't things like gnats flies and mosquitoes flying around if you live in a place where the weather changes but when it's summertime it's like a buffet you see abundances of mosquitoes in warmer climates where it's more humid so if you ever wonder there are some birds that don't even travel down to the south america some of them travel here some of them come to georgia for the summer some of them come to eat up our mosquitoes some of them come to eat up our flies. And that's really, really important for feeding young. And when there's more daylight, when there's more sun, there's plenty of opportunity for them to eat. So do all birds be species migrate? No. no. Not the chickadees. Not the cardinals either. Some species don't migrate at all. A fun fact that we may not realize is that the birds that stay here year round also have a habit of brooding together or living together during the winter so that they can share resources, almost like an adopted family. And then when it's time to raise your young, they say, oh, no, 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 I need my space. This was cool, but it's time for me to go. So. When it comes to different kinds of birds, there are different categories you can look at. You have your residents that are temperate and tropical. So temperate residents are the residents that we see all the time. Tropical residents are the residents that live in your Costa Ricas, your Central Americas, your South, America, er, South American areas. You also have migrants that migrate the long haul, like your Arctic terns. You have birds that migrate not as far, like your ruby-throated hummingbirds, our local hummingbird. And then you have birds that migrate mid-distances, like your raptors. You also have partial migrants, which means that I'm moving, especially if I am a local bird, if I am a bird that does not travel, does not migrate, I might move from one side of a park to the other side of the park to brood in a group of other birds, like our cardinal friend, but not, not the cockatoo. So how do birds know when it's time to migrate? Well, they're kind of born knowing. It's a mixture of when their daylight is running out, when the temperature is getting cooler, when they notice there are less berries, when there are less bugs around, less food. And sometimes you just know. When birds are growing up with their parents, with their mother and their dad and they're in the nest, they learn everything from them. They hear their parents speaking and that's how they learn to, that's how they learn to vocalize. They will watch their parents flying and that's how they learn to fly. They watch their parents feed or if you're a bird of prey, you watch how your parents hunt, and that is, that's how you figure out how to live. And so when you notice that your parents are leaving, you're like, oh, I know how to fly, maybe I should go follow them. It's, it's a knowing that birds have, it's amazing. And the majority of birds that do migrate, migrate at night. So during the day, you might see your geese flying over or your ducks flying above you, but the majority of songbirds, those millions of songbirds that really do the long hauls of migration, will move in the night, move in the nighttime. Does anyone know why that is? Does anyone have a guess as to why that might be? Safety. Safety? Did you have the lack of predators like the predatory birds or not That's survival? exactly right, actually. So birds migrate during the nighttime because it's safer. They have the cover of night to fly long distances without being singled out or attacked by predators. There are some predators that still do attack at night, like owls. But for the majority of the birds of prey that we see all the time, like your red-shouldered hawks locally, your eagles, your red-tailed hawks, those birds, your cooper's hawks or your, fal your peregrine falcons, those are birds that operate during the daytime, birds of prey, because they depend on the heat that's rising to stay in the air and to fly those long distances and to stay up for so long. And during the nighttime, it's cooler. 
So that's part of the reason why they don't operate in the night, in the evening. And during the day, if they migrate, that is when you'll see birds of prey, your larger birds migrate because they need that heat to support their flight. It's a heavier bird, so they use more energy when they're flying. Birds have hollow bones to help them stay in the air. But even if you are a larger bird and you have more weight, it takes a lot more energy for you to flap your wings. Smaller birds, like your hummingbird, is so small that it can fly and its wings are moving so fast it sounds like it's humming. That's how it got its name. But when you have something like your, like your turkey vulture or your red-shouldered hawk, birds like that need the blazing sun and the heat that is rising from the ground in order to stay and circle around. Do you ever wonder if you think you're seeing the same turkey vulture over and over again and you think it never lands? If it's a hot day, that's probably why. There's more heat. So that is why they migrate during the day. Turkey vultures and some of our hawks are not long-term migrators. Most of them are here year-round, so you'll still hear your hawks in December. You'll still see the turkey vultures in January. They stick around, but they're just less active because there's less heat rising. So how do birds prepare for the journey? Well, they have to put on a lot of fat before migration to fuel them for their long journeys. Like this chunky dun dun one right there. So, what do they eat? Well, it depends. A fun fact is that if you look at a bird, you can tell a lot about what that bird eats by how their beak is shaped. If you look at a hummingbird with that long beak that is thin, tubular plants. When you look at a red-tailed hawk with a beak that is hooked, that is sharp for tearing up meat. When you have a beak that is blunt and large and strong and stout, that's really good for busting seeds open. And then when you have a beak that's big and almost drill-like, it helps you hammer into a tree. So birds eat a diverse diet, all depending on what they need. Some birds will eat seeds, plants. Some birds eat other birds or smaller, smaller things like lizards and frogs. And then you have birds that eat a mixture of both. So how do they know when they're going? How do they know where to go? The first thing that birds look at is they follow the stars. So birds migrate and use the sky as their map. They follow the stars to figure out where they're going and when they get lost, they keep note and are intelligent enough to keep note of specific landmarks that they see on their journey to know, okay, I'm headed in the right direction. And they also have a sense of smell that is so keen that they can smell where the ocean is. They know which currents to ride and which ways to go. It's very, very amazing. And they also follow their parents. So they have this innate sense of knowing that allows them to go. So one of the things that we do at Georgia Audubon is through our conservation efforts, we educate people about what they can do because migration's coming up. We have a project called Project Safe Light because birds need the stars to migrate, but if there's a lot of light pollution, they can't. They will get confused especially going over large cities where there's a lot of light going on at night. So my biggest recommendation, if I could say anything throughout this presentation, is that during the middle of September through the beginning of November, if it's nighttime and you have a light that you don't need on in the house, just turn it off. And if you have large glass windows that are in direct sunlight, try to find images or things you can put on the windows to break them up because birds cannot see glass. So during the nighttime, or sometimes even during the daytime, they can collide with those windows simply because they couldn't see them. But if they're images, like we, 
there's bird tape. Some people put pictures of birds or different shapes on the windows to help break it up so that the bird sees that, oh, this is a solid image, I shouldn't run into this. That's something else that we can do. They use the stars as guides. They use landmarks like mountains and rivers to be able to tell where they're going. They have that innate sense of smell and they use the Earth's magnetic pull. So you have your northern hemisphere and your southern hemisphere. They almost have an innate sense of knowing where the equator is. So they follow that sense further south to figure out if they're headed in the right direction. So migration has its pros and it has its cons. I would say the pros are that you get to go to a place where there's an abundance of food, an abundance of resources for you to survive when your home is colder. But your cons are that it's dangerous and that when you come back, a resident could have taken your home. The cool thing about the birds that stick around is that they brew together and then when everything starts to thaw out and it starts to get warmer, they get first dibs of the trees that are around. Even if they knew a bird that lived in the tree next to them, they could say, hey, I think I want to live there now. And when the bird that migrated comes back, they can't do anything about it. Birds are territorial. They sing for two reasons most of the time. They sing either because they are saying to other birds, hey, sorry about that. I have an alarm for my dog on my phone. It goes off. So <laughs> they sing to tell other birds, hey, this is my space. Please leave me alone. Or they sing to say, hey, female bird, look over here. Do you see me? Look at me. Look at, look at how bright my feathers are. <laughs> so that is why they sing. Yes. Can you change the habit of the birds not to go if you keep feeding them and they stay here instead of going to South America? Um, not particularly. It's an innate sense that they have, like, when they're born. So the birds that do migrate don't necessarily change that behavior, although some birds are forced to change that behavior because of factors like weather. So if there's a tropical storm, like a hurricane, or there's a flood, that could easily change the direction that a bird goes. And sometimes if it doesn't have enough food or resources to continue on through a storm, it'll just stay as far as it can go. So sometimes you wonder like, oh, why am I seeing a bird from Antarctica in Texas when it's supposed to be in South America? Maybe there was a storm, maybe something happened to keep that bird from making the journey. But there's really not something that we can do to change that behavior. Unless of course we were affecting how they migrate or their ability to migrate, which is something that we wouldn't want to do. So there are a lot of dangers of migration that we may not be aware of. Some of them we think about all the time, but many of them we are unaware of. The biggest issue is habitat loss and food availability. I think it's amazing that you all live in a community where you are conscious of the plants that are around you and you're thinking about natives. The thing that I like to explain is that birds evolve along with the plants that they grew up around. So your native birds, like native plants. And those plants grow at specific times of the year so that those birds are able to migrate, so they're able to move. And when there are no plants, they have no food. And when there is no food, like this gentleman brought to our attention, we can't migrate. So it's always important to plant natives or there to be an abundance of natives to create habitat so that these birds can have enough energy to move. The next thing that can happen is bad weather, which we just spoke on. We also have buildings and communication towers and collisions. Light pollution. Birds can get confused, especially over large cities. Predators, like owls, hawks, people. Domestic cats. They kill four million birds every single day. So if you do have a cat, I like to say there is no such thing as an outdoor cat because outdoor cats have this habit of, they don't always hunt 
birds. Sometimes they will just play with a bird like it's a toy. <laughs> but playing with that bird can mean life or death if that bird somehow ends up not being able to fly or they have an injured leg or an injured eye and they can't navigate or they're missing, something happens to them. We wanna make sure that they have the best chance of survival. I hear often when I talk about cats that people put bells on their cats so that they can hear where it's going. Birds, because they're adapted around people, a bell isn't gonna deter them from to stop doing what they're doing or to think that there is a cat around. One thing about Atlanta is that there are a lot of parks and people use those parks all of the time and they ride their bikes, they walk, they walk their dogs. The birds that live in these places are so used to seeing people, so used to hearing noise, used to hearing children play, used to hearing animals do their thing that when a new animal comes around, it doesn't bother them too much because they're used to it. That's one of the advantages to when you're a birder and you're going to a place, the birds that are there are so used to seeing people that they'll sit there for you really nicely because they're used to seeing other animals, other organisms in their environment. It's not normal. But with cats, you're adding a predator into an environment, specifically domestic cats, where they have no direct challenges to stop them from doing what they're doing. And left unchecked, they populate, they reproduce at a crazy rate when they get the chance. So just something to think about. Other things that affect them are your pesticides, toxic chemicals, and pollution. So if you use, a certain, if you use certain pesticides on your plants, even if you are planting natives, those things can still poison the birds and then they'll get sick and not be able to fly. So one example that I think of when I think of specifically invasives is that it's very popular in Atlanta for people to plant this plant called Nandina. Nandina kind of looks like holly. It has those silky leaves and red berries. And a lot of businesses plant that plant, that plant because it is easy to maintain. It's evergreen year round. And it almost requires little to no water or maintenance. You can kind of plant it and then leave it. But the berries have cyanide in them. Imagine being a person who lived a diet on nothing but chewing gum. That essentially is what it does to birds. And when you plant toxic chemicals or use pesticides, it can have the same effect. It'll affect their digestive tract, and then pretty soon that could be another reason why they're not able to fly. And I'm not sure if there are many wind turbines here up in Jasper, but that's I think in other parts of the country an issue that, that they need to worry about, especially when they have long lines of wind turbines that are blocking a specific flyway. So ways that we can help is, one, if you have a space where you can provide food, shelter, water, and space, would be to look at your yard, look at the area that you live in, and ask how can you contribute? How can you create more habitat? I mean. This whole community is a very amazing habitat from what I've seen. But if you want to attract birds, you can, it can be as simple as when you mow your lawn to leave all your brush pile in a pile. Or when you cut things off of your trees, cut tree limbs to leave those things in a pile, to not mow as much if you can help it, to put up a bird feeder when it's appropriate in the season to put up a bird bath. These are simple things that we can all do to try to increase the amount of habitat that birds have. We can also, if we have cats, we can keep them inside. At nighttime, I like to shut off the lights that I'm not using. I also like to make sure that if I do have large glass windows, I have these little bird stickers that I put on my windows so that the birds know not to run and collide. So that's something else that you can do. Yes. Yes, I have a question about putting out bird feeders in the summer months, say from April to November. Okay. Now, my, I think the, the birds really need the bird feeders, first. And secondly, in inventory, we have numerous conflicts with bird feeders and bears. You know, what is your comment on feeding during the summer months? Well, I would say during the summer months, it's not as necessary. 
bird feeders are more necessary during the migration seasons because that's when you'll get the abundance of birds. The summer is actually the season when birds are the least active. So that is the time when it gets quieter for birds. They're not, as, they're not singing as much. They're not as active and moving around because they're raising their young. It's far more important, I would say, as an alternative, instead of putting up bird feeders, would just be to see, I know we don't want pests in our, house, in our houses, but to see if, you're, if you have trees in your yard that are contributing to caterpillars, if there's a source where there are flies being attracted, that's still creating habitat for birds if you can't put up a bird feeder. And also, it's an alternative to putting up something that could attract a potentially dangerous predator, like a bear. So, a so, bit. Yes. I was going to ask Ken, when did we say, what has our recommendation here been about bird feeders? April, that I think it's April through November. They don't recommend it. Right. So, not until after November? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. okay. November to then March, that's right. when the bears won't. Okay. Right. But yet the migration is already starting to happen, right? Yes. But your winter birds are here. I think that because you guys, you live in a more forested area, there's far more opportunities for birds to brood, to be safe, to eat. There's lots of places for them to go and to have sources of food. I think it is more imperative in this particular situation to have bird feeders up during the winter time when there's less food and less resources for them. So you can also, some of the things that I think about would be being a citizen scientist. So I like to say that I'm a birder. And whenever I go out birding, I create a checklist. On my phone, there are a couple of apps that I like to use just that, that help me figure out. And one of them that's called eBird is a citizen science app. And essentially, it keeps track of all the birds that I find, that I see. It helps me keep a number. So if I saw seven cardinals and three chickadees and one hawk, I can just record that information, tell the app where I was, and then it'll send that information to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And when more people are posting about what they see, it allows them to create maps of migration about where birds are going. And if there's a certain bird that they're used to seeing in these specific areas, like Georgia, and then in the spring that bird is found in Virginia, and then all of a sudden people stop reporting it. No one's seeing it anymore. As a scientist, I can say, OK, what's happening to this specific bird? We should do some research and figure out what's endangered and what's not. So it contributes in a major way, more than we realize. You can buy shade-grown coffee if you're a coffee drinker. Shade-grown coffee helps to stop the deforestation of the rainforest, because when you grow in shade, they don't have to cut down as many trees in order to grow the coffee that we love. And it also creates more habitat for birds when they're migrating and they're coming down, there's more spaces for them to live. A lot of people don't realize that coffee, the majority of the coffee that we drink is grown in the sun. And when it's grown in the sun, they had to deforest a large area to do that. But if you buy coffee that is grown in the shade and support those initiatives, then less trees are being cut down. So. Um, there are many kinds of coffee that are grown that way, but most of them, you'll see it on the label, on the front of the package about shade-grown coffee, yes. So in a nutshell, that is my presentation about migration. I'm welcome to any questions that you have about birds specifically or about migration in general. Yes. I have a question on the, what you can put on your windows for the birds. Is there a ratio for, like, if you have a floor-to-ceiling window, like, how many feet should you be putting a new one? Um, I know that there is, you should definitely break up the space every couple of feet or inches, depending on how large the window is. If it's a ceiling to floor window, I would definitely recommend maybe every couple, like every half a foot putting something. And it doesn't even have to be in a line. You can put one in the top corner and then one in the middle on the other side or one directly in the center. As long as if you are able to look at that window and see that it's not something clear that you can see directly through, then you know that it's safer. So if your window has natural painting to it, is that okay? Is that 
splits? Yeah. Okay. If you have a window that's broken up into different different sections through painting, that's another thing that is really, really helpful to birds. We have somebody on our staff, his name is Adam Betchwell. He's our director of conservation. If you send him a picture of your window, he can make you a more accurate estimate and also recommend the specific items that you would want if you would want to put these things on your windows. Awesome. Yes. I wanted to ask about the light pollution. So I've heard people say that, well, you know, we don't have that many lights. Like that's really an issue for Atlanta. Um, but then I've also heard that because we're high, a higher elevation, that the lights that we do have can be more impactful. A spot that a spotlight on the top of a mountain can be more um, disruptive to a migration than. How do we get that guy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? I mean, the one. Can you go up and tell that guy to turn off his lights? <laughs> so I wondered if you had any, um, any feedback on um, how important is it for us because of that idea that elevation matters in our, our lights, even though, you know, we're not downtown Atlanta, right? But um, it matters for us, too? Yes, but in a different way. So Atlanta is a very major, it's a large city. There's lots of skyscrapers. And the light pollution also comes from lights that reflect off of those different services, off of those large window panes on skyscrapers and in homes. There are parking lots where the lights are on 24 hours. There's major streets where they have floodlights so that people can see. So it is a major issue in that city for everyone to just turn off as many lights as possible. But here in the mountains, because you're in a very forested area, that one light is going to stand out a lot more to a bird that is flying a long distance. So if there's a bird that's flying through Georgia and not stopping through, and they're flying at this elevation, seeing that one light can throw them off because they're going to be all of that light. It's like turning on the light in the bathroom in the middle of the night. Yeah, right. exactly. You mean you get blinded yeah. when you first turn it exactly. on? That kind of, okay. It's sort of like a night light, but it still can have an impact. Yeah. Has there been any studies that say flocks that normally used to fly over Atlanta, now with the abundance of light, is there a study that shows that they've adapted and they go around, or? Mm -hmm. They really don't go around. Some of them, they still try to fly on through, and the issue is that the number of collisions is rising because there are more buildings and, and less trees. Even though Atlanta is called the city in the forest, they still have things that they can work on. Yes. In the back. Uh, what is the Audubon position on large wind farms? And I mean large. I uh, went through one which was 10 miles long. Oh, gosh. Oh. It's had literally thousands and thousands of very tall uh, oh. rotary vanes. What Does Audubon have a position on that or is it dated to support the, the number of birds? I don't think our organization has a specific statement on large wind farms, but I can speak to the coworkers that I've had the opportunity to speak to. We talk about things about birds that bother us all of the time. And the main thing in our conversation is cats. But when we do get to wind farms, because we do have trips that they take throughout the country and the world to see birds, and they'll see those wind farms in other places, and they'll be like, I don't understand how this was thought out because essentially they, have, they fragment a habitat. So usually they're built in these large green pasture places where they've been cleared, there aren't a lot of trees. And so spaces like that, which normally could be home to a lot of grassland songbirds, birds who nest on the ground, they now can't fly through safely because their habitat is fragmented. So they could fly around, but many birds have to evolve over time to change their minds about things so most of the time birds have to learn and adapt through trial and error so i feel like it's really dangerous i wish that they had a more environmentally inclusive thought process to how they built those to think about land i've done research personally about why birds nest on the ground and why 
it's important to protect them in certain ways and to build our communities out and to build our habitats out in certain ways to protect their quality of life and to also thrive, whether you have a farm or a large piece of land, there are ways to protect, but I don't think we have a specific stance on it. But I personally don't think, I'm not a fan. Not a fan, <laughs> I'm not a fan of the fans, <laughs> yes. Um, you didn't answer the question about whether all birds have feathers. Oh, oh, thank you for pointing that out. So there are a couple things that all birds possess that make them a bird. I like to say, what makes a bird a bird? One thing is that all birds do have feathers. All birds do not fly. All birds have a beak. They all have hollow bones. Some of them migrate, not all of them migrate, but all birds have feathers. No matter, no matter if they're birds from north in Antarctica or they're in New Zealand or they're in the ocean on an island, they all have feathers. Birds, fun fact, are the only organism on this planet that is found on all seven continents. So, very, very cool. They're great indicators to tell us how we're doing with our environment. So I would be worried if I went into a place where there was large, dense forest, lots of water sources, bugs everywhere, but it was quiet and I heard nothing. Yes? Been confused over the years about this one, so you can help me here. You find a baby bird, <coughs> you put it back in the nest. Some people are like, oh no, don't touch it. The mother will never come back. And then I started hearing, which you dispelled today, that, oh, first I have no sense of smell. You're cool to put it back in the nest. What about putting baby birds back in the nest? Help. Can you all hear the question? Should you put a baby bird back in the nest? So, there's one question I want you to ask yourself when you see a baby bird, and that is, does that bird have feathers? If that bird looks, birds are born, most birds, not birds of prey, but most songbirds are born blind and with no feathers on their body. So there are birds with no feathers. When they're born, yes. <laughs> but they do grow them eventually. <laughs> That's why it gets so quiet during the summertime because that's when they're growing their feathers and that's when they're the most vulnerable so they don't want to be found. But when you see a bird on the ground and it has no feathers, it has no way of defending itself. It has no way of knowing what's going on around it. And although birds do have a keen sense of smell to be able to migrate and smell the ocean, a mother isn't going to freak out if you pick her baby up and put the baby back in the nest. So if it has feathers, it's a bird that's learning to fly because they have to learn through trial and error. So oftentimes that bird will be hopping around on a branch and then it might fall on the ground. And its mother, instead of picking it up, will be like, okay, I'm gonna wait for you to figure it out. I'll be up here. And <laughs> birds, even though they're very territorial, most birds are skittish when it comes to people. So if you get close to a baby or close to the nest, there are a few birds that will swoop down and be like, hey, stay away from my nest. But most birds will fly away from a distance to watch what you're doing. They don't leave completely. They just go to a safe distance so that they feel protected. And that's most of the time when you have a baby bird that's on the ground, that's what the mother is doing or the parent is doing. Most birds, when they have babies actually, will stay with the baby until migration, and then after migration, that baby is on its own. There are a few species of birds that kind of stick around in their own little brood for lifetimes, for cycles, for years. One of the birds that do that, as an example, would be woodpeckers. If you notice, you might hear like three or four woodpeckers in the same area, and it's because once a woodpecker has babies, it'll raise that, that brood, they'll fly out to what they're, where they're gonna go during the winter time, and then when the spring comes around and there are new babies, the older babies take care of the newer babies. So it's like they have a family system. There are many birds that build in big groups and take care of their young. And the ones that are territorial, they'll let you know. Birds do this, have this habit called chipping. 
you ever notice if you get close to a nest, a bird will be like chip, chip, almost like a heat seeking sensor. And the closer you get, it'll get faster and louder, like chip, like chip, chip. Camera. Yeah, mm hmm, <laughs> exactly like a backup camera. <laughs> and the closer you get, they're saying, like, hey, I'm either gonna leave or I'm gonna dive. A bird that will dive would be a red winged blackbird, speaking from experience. Mockingbirds. And mockingbirds. Yes. And crows. So long as it's got feathers, leave it alone. Yes. As long as it's got feathers, leave it alone and watch. If it is blind and has and you know where the nest is and you can safely put it back, I would say put it back. But if you can't find the nest or you can't reach the nest, I would the best thing I could say is find a box that's padded with a little bit of tissue paper or like um like newspaper if you can, and try to get that bird to a rehabber. Yes. Yes. Red-winged blackbird, so uh, this is a problem my mom has in Michigan. So she lives on a lake and she's got a pontoon boat. And every year they tend to fulfill the nest underneath the boat. So you can't approach the boat. When you get on the boat, you can avoid being dive bombed they're dive bombing the boat the entire time. Yeah. So uh, just in general, are there ways where it's not ideal for there to be a nest? Because it is very distressing. I'm not talking about the people trying to ride a boat. It's very distressing for the bird because you've left with their babies, right? right? So what is a way that we can, what can we do to avoid a, a, a nest being built in a place that Bird, I mean, I think after years of the year, they stop doing it, but it, it, they do it every year, and it's just, it's crazy. So what can we do to uh, prevent that? One suggestion I have, I've seen people take chicken wire and cover up wherever the nest is being continually built, because birds are creatures of habit, so they tend to nest in the same place or a similar of a place every single time if they can help it. There are th birds like woodpeckers and blackbirds and bluebirds that like to nest in dead trees and tree cavities. So if you have any open cavities and you can put something over it that prevents the birds from going into there without necessarily blocking it, that is what I would recommend. When I was growing up, we had an issue with red-winged blackbirds. They would go into the vent where the steam came out from our laundry machine. And we would wonder, like, how come our clothes aren't getting dry? And then finally my dad opened it up and saw like, oh, there's like a whole nest in here. And of course the birds were gone, but he put wire over the patch, over the hole to keep them from going in there. Another suggestion, another thing that I hear about is woodpeckers and pecking on people's houses. If you can, this may be a very like impromptu idea, but we would put owl pictures on our house and the woodpeckers thought they were real owls and they left it alone. So you could also put up pictures of predators too. Pictures of predators or blocking the space that they like to use is another way to deter them. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Um, are there any more questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take a minute to look around at the materials that we have um, and take them for yourselves. Chairs go in the things in the back. Maybe if we get a couple.